Welcome back to the Nutra Medical Report. And our co-host on the first uh, of hour three on Thursdays is Tim Alexander. Tim, we've got a lot of stories we're following. The main one you mentioned before the break was the story about Iran and several statements by the senior military personnel. What's going on? Well, actually, there's been statements on both sides, both the American side and uh, the Iranian side. And the statements have a a dark undercurrent to them. The Iranians uh, are making it clear that if war breaks out, uh, that they will be able to attack uh, not only American bases in the Middle East, uh, Israel, and the Gulf Cooperative States, but they will be able to bring uh, destruction uh, on the American mainland greater than what America has ever suffered in its history. And when you uh, factor in the American Civil War, you know, that's that's, uh, pretty significant. I would say, uh, you know, the average person looking at that would say, yeah, right. But uh, the reality... I don't think they should underestimate. The new have a military expertise to discuss what they have. Let's go through the list. Well, the biggest thing they have is they have the equivalent in terms of potential kill uh, uh, to global strategic thermonuclear warfare, and that is advanced biological warfare based on recombinant DNA genetic engineering technology, uh, which they basically bought uh, a big part of uh, what had been the Soviet Union's uh, program when the Soviet Union collapsed about 20, 21 years ago. And they spent uh, a great deal of money uh, since then developing that. So they have uh, probably the most sophisticated advanced bio-war program on Earth. There are many others that have some pretty sophisticated programs, including yeah. us. But they're, and they're, they're, By the way, they have delivery systems, too. They have the Shahib system. they got cruise missiles. They have drones that are second to none from America or Russia or anybody else. They're not they have a, at all. And they have 5,000 Abdullahs uh, uh, who are, uh, uh, are spread throughout the United States and Canada and the uh, Western Europe and, and so forth who have uh, frozen vials of viruses in their freezers. And uh, when they're uh, given a, uh, a coded uh, call, we'll take the stuff out and uh, mix it up uh, with a little sterile water and uh, uh, go into a shopping mall or a movie theater, weather, and atomize it. Uh, uh, which might be something that looks like a cell phone, but uh, they'll walk around and they'll spray it. And nobody even notice it, but you'll, some people will breathe it. And two weeks later, people will begin turning up at emergency rooms with very strange and very horrible fatal diseases. And in the meantime, they will have spread. Each person will be a vector and will have spread that disease to dozens, if not hundreds or thousands of other people who will continue to spread it. That's advanced bio war. That's a nightmare right out of hell. So they they have that capacity, and uh, that is why they, you know, they're they're, they're not uh, living in fear of Israel or the United States. They have a a MAD, a mutually assured destruction uh, capability with us. We can kill them, but they can kill us. You know, what they're basically saying, if we translate and read between the lines, we want to do business with America. We want to modernize, like Mossadegh back in the 50s, wanted a petrochemical industry and plastics industry, which, by the way, they still don't have. So they have to get their fuel from China. Even the Shah of Iran was talking about that. You know, he had right. This- right. And, and, and what they're really saying is, between the lines, we're Westerners. We like your jeans. We like your perfume. We like your barbecues. We like American movies. We want, you know, if you walk the streets of Tehran, you say, my gosh. These young people want to be like young people in the West. They want to have freedom to think about things. Many of them, for example, are persecuting Christians now. And Islam is becoming much more extreme. Years ago, it was much less extreme. It was much more, we call it, not on a secular nation, but tolerant. There's a large Jewish community, a large Christian community there. They're now being persecuted. And we have Christian pastors from America that are being jailed that are Iranian Christian dual citizenship. What the Iranians are saying is, we want to end all this because we now know that you have an intention, and Israel has the intentions of attacking and destroying us, and we need you to know that we can destroy you too. 
So no, it's not a one-way street here. You know, you're not just going to come in and just bully us. We're going to take you down. In other words, it's like a little old lady walks down the street of, say, uh, New York City, late at night in the wrong district, and a bunch of attackers uh, go to attack her, and she opens up her vest, and she says, now, you might want to attack me, but I have a bomb vest on. So if you try to attack me, I'm going to press this button, and I'll die, but you're all going to die, too. So if you let me walk home, you're okay, but if you don't, I'm going to press this button, and you're going to die instantly. Well, actually, That's what something Iran is like saying. that happened to a friend of mine's mother, and, and she was uh, quite a character. Uh, they were driving to uh, from the Midwest to Texas to, to visit my buddy and his family, and her husband, uh, who had been a, a senior corporate uh, VP, uh, they pulled into a rest stop, and he stayed in the car with <laughs> their, their poodle, and she went in to use the, uh, the restroom, and two ruffians came up and were going to uh, rob her. Well, they didn't count on the fact that she had a small pistol in her purse, and she said, I think it was three words, leave or die. And they chose to leave rather quickly, which is the only reason they they lived through the experience, because she would have sent them to their maker very quickly. Yeah, so probably, um, what you tend to find is women, actually, with handguns are better shots, more accurate, and cooler, uh, cooler thinking in a state of crisis. So you don't piss off a lady with a gun. <laughs> well, not this late. But uh, anyway, to, uh, uh, to, to get back to this, uh, uh, the American side uh, has been saying that, uh, and that this goes all the way up to the very highest levels in the Obama administration, that uh, we are in danger of a war if we don't do uh, a, an agreement with Iran on the nuclear issue. And everybody is racketing the the level up to well, if we don't do this, we're going to have a global war. We're going to have World War Three. Oh, so it's all so ridiculous. So, oh, it's real simple. All you need to do is just get an international agreement to verify they're not going to reach beyond a certain level, and make sure everybody's on side, but, including but Russia. It's not the, see, from Netanyahu's point and from the globalist point, it, it has absolutely nothing to do with the exactly. nuclear program. The point is we have Netanyahu's nuts. It needs to be in a locked room in a padded in a padded cell with a posy jacket on and an antipsychotic <laughs> running in his veins. So the man is crazy, so is Lieberman, and the, the people are not running it for the state of the sake of the people in Israel or Americans. They want to yank us with a choke chain around our neck into a yet another very deadly war. Only this one is not just going to cause problems overseas. It's almost like Obamacare. Yeah, it's one thing to have Americans die in Benghazi because of incompetence and cover up by Obama. It's quite another thing to rob people's banks and kill people because you take away their insurance and they've got cancer or they have a cardiologist with an unstable cardiac condition. Whole different ball of wax when you take away the insurance from 7 to 18 to 35 to 50 million Americans, well, I, which is I, what I, the uh, are. Before I go there, let me, let me say, uh, Netanyahu, by the way, is also saying that if uh, uh, he's throwing the gauntlet down and saying if, you know, we agree to uh, uh, a, a treaty or an agreement with Iran, uh, it will lead to war. If, uh, you know, if his... If How is the treaty going to lead? How, how is the treaty going to lead to war? Secondly, well, you know, just think about I mean, it logically. If, if Iran launched one weapon, let's say they got a weapon from Pakistan, because they have an agreement with Pakistan, and they'd launch one weapon, being an idiot, to uh, to hit Israel. Israel would whack them so bad with radio, intermediate range nuclear mi missiles and their bombers, it would be ridiculous. Uh, Iran and would cease to exist within a matter of hours. It, it's not going to be days, and at the very least, all the infrastructure will be gone, most of the major cities will be dust, all and the military be bases will be wiped bury the dead. <laughs> right, and so the fact is, and here's the other problem, Iran, even if there's no people there, will launch, launch on command automated systems that are deeply buried, and by the way, they're so deep, even our best bunker busters can't get them. Like the, you know, the 30 ton, you know, giant ones have to go in Hercules C-130s. They can't get the deepest places. The Iranians have been thinking decades ahead of what we could do to them. They well, there's not. also the super gun with uh, with uh, advanced bio war uh, material. Gerald Bull. Yeah, Gerald, Gerald Bull, yeah. Bull's little invention. Yeah, I'm sure they have those as well. Uh, yeah, if they if and they that's do anything. Yeah, that's why the ancient uh, Persians knew they were masters of warfare. Yep.
Welcome back. Another major story you have, uh, Tim, uh, talking about what's going on in Europe. Give us the latest because a lot of people follow your blog in Europe because you follow this very closely. They tried to make uh, Europe the United States of Europe. What's going on between Well, Dutch, you know, you, uh, you have uh, increasing, uh, like the Dutch Euroskeptic Euro Wilders and Francis Le Pen, uh, their political uh, parties have agreed to unite in their effort uh, to basically end uh, or to reduce the power of the EU. Uh, the European Union, the EU, is largely the creation of the Rothschild banking empire. And the way it was set up, and, and uh, you know, and, and uh, oh my goodness, 30-some uh, years ago in political science class, I began studying uh, the, the direction they were going in. And they have bureaucrats make rules. Now, there's a, a European parliament, but it it's not like most parliaments where it passes a law. Uh, the the laws are written by faceless, nameless bureaucrats, and. Uh if you want to challenge the law, it's very difficult, and you don't have a face, you don't have a person, and that's the way it was designed to be, uh, because that takes the power away from the elected representatives and puts them uh, in a uh, you know a, a body that the cartel, the global banking cartel, can control better. Right. Uh, but so, people are, so, are you know yeah, yeah. you have so you have saying, it's not, it's not, it's, Look, it's not a in the United States, in, 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 in other words, United where you have Kingdom, senators. You don't have senators and congressmen. In other words, there's no representation, is what you're saying. Well, there are members of the European Parliament, but they don't... You don't elect them, though. You don't elect them. These guys no, are just they, there. No, they do elect them, but, but here's the point. Uh, the lawmaking is mostly a bureaucratic uh, process as opposed to uh, laws that are introduced by members of the European Parliament and voted on. Uh, most of the rules that the people in the EU have to follow that come from the European Union are written and, in effect, passed by uh, faceless, nameless bureaucrats. And that, and and of course, we're moving more and more towards that. Uh, this Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which is being negotiated by Obama and some Europe or some Pacific nations. Uh, once again, will will basically allow uh, people in the State Department and Commerce Department to rewrite the law at whim. And I question whether that's constitutional, but even more than whether it's constitutional, it is a basic uh, anti-democratic uh, process. And that's, the, that's the, the, the criticism that many people in Europe have of the EU. It's basically anti-democratic. Uh, it gives far too much power to the, the, the global banking cartel members. And, um, uh, you know, you, you have uh, Cameroon, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, uh, announced about a day or two ago that uh, austerity uh, is, is going to be with the UK, uh, United Kingdom for many decades to come. Uh, in other words, the people that have it all, the not 1%, but the 0.00001% uh, who want more, who have almost everything and want it all, uh, you know, they're not, they're not happy. They've got to have it all. And those, the rest of us, well, we can just suffer. We can make do with less and less and less. And uh, I was speaking today to a friend of mine who uh, had a stroke, and uh, he comes from a pretty good background, but he's, he's quite poor now, and his wife's poor, and, and uh, well, her, one of her sons is living with him with his family. He can't find a job. Well, who can? we got 102 million Americans out of work. Uh, and and uh, they they could get thirty dollars for five people in the household, one a little two year old girl, uh, thirty dollars a month on food stamps, and she said that's not even worth it, but all the hassle. Uh, so you know, at a time of economic uh, depression, not recession, but depression uh, in the United States, and you're seeing much the same thing in Europe. You're seeing cutbacks. Well. How are people supposed to eat, you know? And uh, the people didn't uh, drive all the jobs overseas. I didn't hear a great demand from the American people. Let's ship all of our factories to uh, the People's Republic of China or to some little third world country where they work for 10 cents an hour. I, I, I don't remember the American people standing up and shouting for that. Uh, some globalists wanted that so they could uh, make even more money. But... Uh, 
you know, we're we're in a world of hurt. And it was really kind of an eye opener to see my 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 buddy in such a bad financial situation. I loaned him a few bucks and took him lunch, and now you know I do but do that periodically. But the point is, uh, that's one example out of millions. And we, what has really changed? Look, we're sitting on the greatest real estate, the greatest industrial base in human history here in North America, and yet you have a hundred and two million adults of working age out of work in America, and the mainstream news media s- still keeps talking about a recovery from a recession, no, give they're doing a is break. A, they're saying if the stock market numbers go up, even though the actual value of the dollar is dropping like a rock, what they've done now is they've contracted worldwide credit. Well, who they've the hell can, uh, can afford to be in the stock market? I'm right, talking and, about and people that the, are struggling to eat and feed their babies. Yeah. Yeah, we had uh, Walter Bury and I talked to him last week. And uh, he told me, he said, you know, that the public, basically, people don't know this, but the state, the federal government, the counties, and so on, and countries, are all in 83% of the marketplace. So it's international investment is actually by all of the countries and all of the states and all of the communities, etc. And then what we have is that's called globalization. It's global corporatization. And there's a marriage between global corporatization and the global elite in these special agencies like the NSA, CIA, Interpol, etc. So the fusion of all these agencies and corporations is global, not, and global fascism. We're not just dealing with national fascism like the Nazis. We're dealing with global fascism. That glo- and that, that global fascism means you have to have the threat of war, even if you don't have war, so you can maintain a military industrial complex and spying on everybody, even though your own citizens like grandmothers with intense pads on going through the airport, uh, and saying you have to assault them because they could carry a weapon in their wheelchair. You know, come on. And, and, and they're listening to grandma's phone conversation with her grandkids. Right. And, so, and it, all, all because of some mythical terrorist. And if you really know what's happening, most so-called terrorist incidents have been done by intelligence agencies. They're false flags. Uh, here's right. another. This is a story that's, uh, that really fascinates me. It, it, it's so scary. 37 out of 50 U.S. states now allow corporations to get rich off of prison labor. This is the new slavery. Right. Crazy. Uh, so, you know, you have people in prison. Uh, and by the way, one out of every hundred American adults is behind bars. One out of a hundred, and they've been they've been taken out of the workforce. Their the rights have legally be, been stripped away, and they're basically slaves. They if they're paid anything for prison labor, it's a few pennies an hour. So they can spend it buying candy bars or cigarettes in the prison uh, you know uh, store, and. Oh, sorry, yeah. uh, yeah. So you 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 have this situation where we have more people per population in prison than North Korea, than China, than any other country on earth. And that's not right. That's not the American way. It's good and for it business used to though. be that way, by the way. Good for good for business if you're a globalist uh, uh, basically a globalist Nazi. How's that? Yeah, exactly. Pretty crazy. Amazing report. Uh, thank you, Tim. Back in a moment with Chris Harris. Tomorrow, firing line coming up. And tomorrow, preparedness, civil defense, earth changes. Welcome back to the Nutra Medical Report. First, we're going to have Chris Harris give us an update on Fukushima Daiichi, and then we're going to hear from Professor McCann, who's on in the first hour. Uh, Chris, what's the latest? Today, they're starting to move these fuel rod assemblies, and we have incompetent people trying to put out videos and other material and brochures telling us, don't worry, be happy, like Bobby McFerrin's song about a decade ago. Uh, and uh, people that have two clues shouldn't buy this. The Japanese, TEPCO, and uh, the people involved here, General Electric, really sh- don't deserve to have any trust. So what's the latest, Chris? Sorry, I had it on mute. Okay, the latest is this week, it looks like they're going to uh, attempt to remove the first of the controlled batch of fuel that they've decided to uh, go for, and it would be the most uh, the easiest. They're going up to the low lying fruit first, and as I would expect, they would test out all their equipment and such. And uh, hopefully, uh, at that point, I know you know we don't like to use that word. Hopefully, that uh, 
they're going after the first uh, batch that doesn't look like it had any damage to it. Of course, you can't tell because there could have been debris that fell within the crack, that, or the crack, it's a slot that it surrounds each of these stem fuel. Yeah, it's about a half an inch, 13 millimeters, and we don't know what's going to happen except that they did answer some questions about that, and that's good because they needed to answer those questions. They didn't just sit down and say, you know, we're we're uh, we're driving the bus and you sit down and shut up. They didn't say that this time because a lot of people are concerned about what may happen if a fuel assembly gets scratched and, bre- and breaks because it's been subject to seawater and corrosion over a period of time now, which is not the uh, best environment see, for see, see, aging. Seawater corrosion and, and neutron flux annealing of the metal and the plastic and those support structures, as well as subsidence where the entire building is bending over and they dropped a crane on top of these fuel rod assemblies too. They did indeed drop, they do have uh, images of, uh, it's called a bale, although they're calling it a handle, that's where the grapple hook hooks onto a fuel assembly bundle, and they're crushed in some, some areas, and it's hard to tell in the slot exactly what the condition of the rest of the fuel assembly is. But the concern for me would be if one falls apart as you're pulling it, will you get a criticality action you know, or an interaction with several other uh, pieces of fuel? And, and, and that, of course, would... Uh, well, in that, if that happens, then you will have an airborne release because at that point it will all bubble up. And you we were talking earlier on your show about iodine formation. Well, that is where it would come from in the next step. So, of course, we're all going to be watching this very closely, and their their equipment is is all brand new inside inside the uh, newly erected. Uh, structure that we talked for a long time ago about that they needed to cover these buildings, and that was one thing we did say, and that you know, that's, and they they really did do that. Now, yeah. um, we don't know how uh, to what codes that these were built and to uh, how you know, how fortified the structure is. It looks it looks from the outside pretty beefy, but uh, you know, it was hastily erected again. It, you know, the planning was pretty. Yeah. Plus the storage tanks, etc. Uh, the question oh. I'd have is: you're, you're a safety officer, uh, either on site or here in North America. If there's a major power fork fire, what would you recommend? Say in your home, whether you're on the west coast, east coast, or in the mountains, what would you recommend you do for your family? What would what are the steps you'd do? And then I'll kind of you know add to that a bit, and then we're going to bring on Professor McCanny. Well, you know that I uh, keep on deferring to you on that one because that's not my area of expertise. My area is Oh, okay, let me, let me run this by you, what I would say. Let me okay. run this by you and see if, if you were in the plant or nearby community, yeah. let's say you were doing work for TEPCO and you had to live in an apartment, say, a mile away, and you had a major radiation release, the first thing you do is if you had a hair, airport, if you had a HEPA filter, the particulates you want to get out of the air, you want to seal off your room with duct tape around your windows, around the edges to make sure it's airtight. Um, you'd also want to take radio protectant nutraceuticals like Nutritrala, Nutriodine, Nutridefense, etc., cell detox glutathione, high dose power C, etc. You want to have a NIOSH mask to add an extra layer of airborne protection so you don't get any particles that embed in your airways. And they go down, of course, the GI tract as well. Uh, you want to take probiotics because that takes out, according to Dr. Osof Jurakovic, 85% of the radioisotopes. You want to take Keeler Max. Our liquid zeolite, which is the most powerful zeolite available, so I take Keeler Max first and then zeolite. Uh, people need to be prepared for the fact they need to hunker down for a period of days. They should have a data logging uh, radiation detector they can run with a USB cord to their computer and actually monitor the radiation outside to make sure it's safe to even go out because it may not be for anywhere from three days to a few weeks. Uh, Professor McKenna, oh. you, you have some expertise in this area. Uh, what, what else would you suggest? And then we're going to hear your story about ISON and what's happening with the NERC people. Uh, so far, they're extremely obtuse in their reporting on what's happening with the North American Electrical Reliability Corporation. But I always worry when the government does a drill because they haven't actually hardened the power grid. They haven't actually proven that they've made backup power safe. Even reactors are, are their water intake for their diesel generator backups is below the high water mark. We talked about this in the last few years with Chris Harris. Uh, I see a government that's completely incompetent, who doesn't fix the problem and then does a test and then says it's okay, everything's fine, and there's no real-world testing by turning off the power or actually upgrading systems before they do that. So I don't know what they're actually doing, but the timing uh, with the ISON comet is pretty quirky, isn't it? 
That, that is very quirky. Uh, Dr. Bill, I want to go back just a step. You were talking about preparedness for a radiation dose. Yes. And the, the, the thing people have to realize is you have to stay put. You have to have water that right. is uh, non, pre- non-radioactive. not contaminated. And uh, uh, I, you know, I don't want to boast about what I have on my webpage, but I have two items. One is a modular filtration and storage system where you can uh, store in sealed containers water. And the other item is a pre-filter designed to take radiation. Radiation typically grabs onto dust and powder and is designed to take that out before you put it into your water filter. So uh, water is an essential thing that people need and they have to be prepared to have their own water supply. So anyway, just yeah. in a, yeah. a and, and, one And I think minute. you have good systems, too. I, I have, for example, a water filtration system I'm putting in my roof water collection. So even when I water my plants in my garden and my fruit trees, but I think you have to have, John Moore's rule is two is one and one is none. We have the BEV system, BEV 200, emergency backup power system that has a 12-volt pump that is portable. You can run it right off your car or truck. We have the best systems, but I think it's important to have systems. You've got to take out the radioisotopes because it's not a matter of it's theoretical that you're going to get radiation. We're all being poisoned as we speak. This is not a theory. This is just a plain, ugly fact. And the people who want to dispute it, I dare them to come on the air and at any time discuss the fact that they think it's okay. And there's a number of wonks for the nuclear industry trying to say it's fine. Say people with the down that know the nuclear industry is killing itself, because it's not getting rid of radioactive waste, it's a prime target for terrorists, not, and also just with earthquakes and volcanoes. Fukushima is a good example. They, they didn't have, you know, they even destroyed a lot of the natural terrain there to actually put the Fukushima plant down 75 feet lower than it should have been, 25 meters, uh, which, by the way, would have probably put it high enough that they wouldn't have swamped over the uh, diesel generators and they wouldn't have had the problems. Although cooling, the reactor number one was sitting on a fault line, so the earthquake apparently cracked right through the reactor core even before the tsunami struck. So we have, you know, they shouldn't put reactors in tsunami zones or on earthquake fault lines. But New Madrid is a good example. The uh, Diablo Canyon reactor up in Northern California sitting on the convergence of three fault lines. The San Onofre reactor is right near the San Jacinta upthrust zone, which is actually five miles off the coast, not 125 like Fukushima Daiichi. It's right off of the coast near... Um, the islands there, the Catalina Islands, people need to be aware that uh, the nuclear industry doesn't give a, a rat's behind, that the government is always incompetent, and that they usually get the most, uh, what I call, compliant nuclear and scientists that will go along with industry or government policy, rather than people who actually care about, you know, the safety of whatever they're doing. So when we come back, I want to hear your comments on that, and I, son, and more from Chris Harris. Uh, this is a dangerous day. Uh, we have NERC simulations going on, which I don't think anything's going to happen because they know that we're primed and ready to say false flag, false flag. And that, by the way, with the truth media, the news media, we're the news, they're the snooze. We're keeping our eyeballs on them. We'll be back in a moment with Chris. Welcome back. Uh, in, on the break, we got some uh, top announcements. One of them is uh, re- with uh, Chris regarding re- reactor number one and the total crack now proven in the containment, so the water's flowing out. Oh, tell us more details, Chris. Okay. Um, TEPCO did send down a, a robot on a boat, and it uh, was remote controlled, and it did indeed find water pouring out of several locations in reactor one's. Uh, uh, the um, containment structure, and basically it, sh- it shows that it was ruptured during, uh, most likely during the uh, explosion that happened. I think that one was March 14th, uh, 2011. And it's just as we uh, discussed before, that uh, all the water that gets pumped into the, the cool, what's left of the core, what we were calling the nuclear lava lamp, I guess at that point, you know, uh, it was coming, it goes in and, and it's flowing back out again and goes right into the secondary side, which is basically um, the reactor building or what's left of the reactor building. And at that point, 
it, through other cracks and all, it's highly likely that because the water level is not going up in that part of the building, it's flowing out into the environment. And that's, you know, and so that's, again, that's not really good news. That's amazing. Now, uh, Professor McKinney, we, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, you, you know, you're good at put, kind of connecting the dots with all these issues. You got space weather that's crazy. You got strange things going on with NERC. You got Obama literally uh, pontificating and acting imperial, even with all his executive orders, even saying he's going to do executive orders to fix Obamacare, which is unconstitutional. Uh, we've got so many things going on with this country where Obamacare is destroying the economy, killing the medical profession, and killing patients. Then we've got, uh, you know, no real investment in infrastructure. Our space program has gone black op now, so NASA no longer is getting proper funding. It's like one thing after another. He's decreasing the funding and proper protection with the military. What we have is everything is, uh, he has the anti-Midas touch. It turns literally Obama like the Pied Piper of Hamlin. Everything he touches now turns to human fecal matter. It's absolutely disgusting. And the fact that the Republicans haven't impeached this monster uh, several years ago after all of the other events, and the latest being Benghazi, now Obamacare finally hit people's pocketbooks. Uh, and then we've got these simulations going on with expanding powers of the National Security Agency that's ticked off Europeans and everybody. America's reputation worldwide is shot. Our money is, is now to even have a legislative bill in Russia to literally declare the American dollar illegal in Russia. This is an actual bill by the major legislature of the Duma. Uh, you know, people need to start taking notice here that everybody, including the Chinese, everybody is ticked off with us, and our so-called leader is, is even ticking off the Democrats and wondering how can we get our, our political feet back under us because Obama doesn't give a damn that we're not electable for the 2014 election. The Democrats are done. If the, and they're not going to tweak it. This is untweakable. Uh, what do you think will happen if we have Fukushima and we have martial law with Obama? Because I think the chances of a major neuro, nuclear event happening at Fukushima triggering off martial law in America is probably higher than almost anything else. Second, I would say, is a coronal mass ejection caused by one of these comets that comes in, probably significantly less likely, uh, or an economic collapse caused by the bond market run from India, Turkey, uh, Brazil, etc., causing uh, the collapse that way. But there's multiple things, including Obama's compliance with the uh, with the Israeli plan to attack Iran, which is insanity. Plus, I mean, everything the man does is absolutely incompetent. It's amazing. Yeah, this, the, I I don't know where this is going. I'm amazed that the world and the United States are still even uh, the semblance of what they are today. But right. the banking world in the United States has crashed. Um, you cannot use American credit cards in many foreign countries today. Uh, you cannot uh, use uh, American debit cards in many foreign countries. Uh, it's it's unbelievable what's going on. Yeah, the, the world is obviously, and for for correct reason, turning against the United States. And as I've always said, it's the problem is the American public for allowing this to get the, to the state. Yeah, uh, Obama's just a symptom. He's a symptom of a lot of gimme people that don't realize, for example, if you were poor, I don't want to take the food out of your mouth, but I believe in workfare, not welfare. I don't care if you're hostbound and you have lost both legs, we can give you a job even if it's on a phone. Everybody should be able to do something to make it a better nation. And uh, the and also even going online to school. I mean, we also need to make sure that our young people aren't settled with such giant debt that they can't actually get a career or technical training. If you look at the number of engineers who graduate from Beijing, it's more engineers than all our engineers and PhDs combined in all of North America. It's ridiculous. Just in Beijing. We're not talking about Shandong or Shenzhen or anywhere else in China. That's just an example of a totally different attitude toward what's going on there. It's It's just insanity. So... Uh, I don't understand why they think that uh, this is a rational thing to run the country this way, but it's destroying us. And uh, this NERC yeah, trial, which again is another way, it's like they're being very obtuse about it. Well, why announce it if you're going to be obtuse and not tell us what you're actually testing? Why? You know, yeah, the, uh, can you the, figure that out? I don't understand it. The NERC test is very bizarre, but it's, uh, like I've said, it's simply putting us one step closer to a false flag power outage. Um, I right. In other words, it's, it's testing the response ago. of the people. It's not testing the power grid because 
if they're going to just do a computer simulation, why would they announce it? Just do it. If they're going to test the equipment, yeah. you know, then, then upgrade it first because they'll know from the previous data where there's weaknesses in the system. I mean, they found this in California. I was reading about NERC here that the California is cooperating because they're concerned about testing the viability of adding, you know, 11... Uh, thousand megawatts of power by 30,000 additional power uh, generators on here. Okay, it, says, it talks about the Grid X2 exercise. In other words, people are going to generate solar and wind and other power and dump it back into the grid. The grid, and this is what my experts in California alone have already told me, the grid can't survive this. They can't survive the targets that the government's made for just adding solar and wind power. It'll blow the grid to pieces. They know this. Why don't they just fix it first rather than saying, well, we're going to race ahead anyway and put all of this transient surges of power on it, depending on the sunlight or the wind, and expect the power grid to be able to heal itself. And then their idea is to put smart grid in there to shut off your appliances so you can only do your laundry after 11 o'clock at night like they do in Sweden. This is insanity. This is double stupid. Plus, it also makes it easier to be hacked into by Chinese Tianjin Blue Army if they do really truly want to do cyber terrorism. Yes, sirree, you put in a smart grid and you can actually hack in and shut her thing off and cause a power blackout to nuclear plants. Your comment, uh, Professor McKinney and Chris. Um, yeah, the, uh, the insanity level is you have people that don't know anything <clears throat> running the government. Uh, how can you take a guy who was a, a, an attorney in Chicago and uh, questionable other qualifications and make him put him in, in charge of the United States with all of its infrastructure and complicated uh, scenarios. I mean, well, first I, off, you, you need know, to do an IQ that, test. No one should get into the presidential running race unless you have an IQ 160 plus. Number two, you have to have a broad background, which is science based. Most of the politicians, for example, in China are engineers or PhDs. Very tiny amount or, or have the, a quote geopolitical or legal background. The vast majority of our so-called politicians have no science background whatsoever, and they have no idea of how even economic systems work. Whatever Mickey Mouse level of economics they have, they're totally corrupt, and they don't understand any science. And the real purpose of government is to create infrastructure and protect the nation militarily, and they don't understand either one of those. It's ridiculous. Well, well the other role of government is to stay out of the way. Because, exactly. Uh, the, the, the role of government is simply to provide a highway so everybody can drive on it and do commerce, not to put exactly. toll booths up and tax everybody to death while they're driving well, on the highway. Uh, well, the that's why they even keep people poor. They keep people poor because the uh, bureaucracy and industry of keeping people poor creates a giant undercult, superculture of government bureaucrats that have to be there because you have a poor population that requires their next bowl of gruel, the next food stamps, the next mediocre health care that will be administered by foreign medical doctors and nurses because all of our doctors and nurses, if they have two clues and have decency, will quit. It's just disgusting, isn't it? Amazing. I can hear the bumper music, and we will be back tomorrow. It's going to be firing line. Thank you, Chris Harris and Professor McCanny. Major updates on Hour 2 tonight. I'll be on a guest on the Rents program, expanding on these and other issues. Firing line, you want your questions in, do call 888-212-8871 to place your orders from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., Monday to Friday Pacific time, or you can do it online 24-7. All of our radio shows, all of our direct TV programs, everything is free. You can access anywhere in the world. We'll be back on hour number three tomorrow also with preparedness, civil defense, martial law, John Moore and Ann Morrison. Thank you, Professor McCanny, Chris Harris, Tim Alexander, and all you listeners out there. Take care and take action. We'll be back tomorrow trying to give you answers and give you some help. Pray for America. 